For the longest time, I was resisting and I was stuck in this、um, space of trying to change the reality of certain situations. Instead of trying to like change certain things that I had no control over, I stopped resisting those things and stopped resisting what is and began to allow. And that allowed me to take my destiny into my own hands and see what life had in store. That was Tony Lupinacci, and I'm Henry Winslow. You're listening to Dharma Talk. Dharma Talkers, you're here. You made it. This is my show, Dharma Talk. And what do we do here? Well, we go deep. We ask the important questions. The ones that cause us to reflect and connect. When we connect to others, we see ourselves in the other, and the separation fades away. That's yoga, and that is our collective dharma, as I see it, to wake up to our unity. Every week on Dharma Talk, I'm fortunate enough to connect with a yogi I admire, and this week that yogi is Tony Lupinacci. But hey, before I share that conversation with you, can you do me a favor? Subscribe to the podcast if you haven't done so already. Just hit the subscribe button so that you get the new episode every Thursday. And if you're already a subscriber, you've been listening in a while, and you enjoy the show, leave a rating and review. This really helps to get the podcast out there and get more people who can benefit from it to listen. And if you have the financial means to do so, please consider making a donation to support the show. It does cost me money to put this show out there, and I have upgraded the quality of the show recently, which, of course, required an investment. So, if you find the show valuable, make a donation. You can do that at henrywins.com/donate. Now, I've got a couple of announcements for you before we get into the show. At the end of this month, September 27th through 29th, I'm going to be teaching at Horizon Hot Yoga in Dallas, Texas. I'll be teaching my Hatha Vinyasa classes, an arm balance workshop, and an especially special workshop that I call Gratitude Practice. It's a heart-centered Vinyasa class followed by meditation to bring in abundance and appreciate all the blessings in our lives. Then the following weekend, I'm going to Austin, Texas, back to my old stomping grounds at Yoga East Austin, to teach a four-day immersion with Jared McCann. Each day begins with a morning sadhana of pranayama, meditation, kriya, and then we go into a JM Vinyasa class, the signature style of Lighthouse in Brooklyn. In the afternoons, we do workshops, posture clinics, and satsang discussions. So, for the details on these workshops, these events, and everything else I have coming up, please head to henrywins.com/events. Are you feeling stuck or stagnant? Are you looking for a catalytic experience to ignite radical transformation? Join me and my wife Veronica Lombo for an unforgettable retreat designed to ground your body, purify your mind, and expand your connection to consciousness through yoga, sacred silence, and natural immersion. Our week together in Bali will offer you the perfect environment to refocus on what is calling you, your purpose, your perfect path, your dharma, so that you can move forward with renewed vigor into growth and service to others. The days will be structured around guided group meditations, vinyasa and hatha yoga classes, delicious and clean plant-based meals, of course, and opportunities for free exploration of nature, both outside and within. Come honor your past experience and effort, celebrate where you are now, and lay a pure foundation for the year to come. Clear the space for reconnection to source with us in Bali, December fifth through eleventh, twenty nineteen. Get the details and make a deposit at henrywins.com/bali. My guest this week on Dharma Talk is an old friend, Tony Lupinacci, at Tony Lupinacci on Instagram. 
recognized the deep cathartic powers of a consistent yoga practice when he started a decade ago and has since made the pursuit of his yogic path a priority. Tony has been teaching for eight years, completed seven teacher training courses, and spent countless hours in self-study and practice. His teaching style weaves elements of Ashtanga, Bikram, Forest, Dharma, and Katona Yoga. He values breathwork, Kriya meditation, and mantra practice, and he incorporates them into his teaching to help his students better understand themselves. There was a time not too long ago that Tony and I saw each other every single day. We worked closely together at Lighthouse Yoga School in Brooklyn until Tony felt the spark of inspiration to uproot from a life in New York City and turn the page onto a new chapter. Needless to say, Tony and I had a lot to catch up on and Dharma Talk seemed like the perfect opportunity to share the very inspiring shifts in Tony's life as of late, and as well as all of the attitudes and practices that have made these shifts possible. So some of the things that we talk about in this conversation are being in a supportive romantic relationship with another yoga teacher who practices and teaches a totally different style of yoga and how that's played out for Tony. We talk about leaving a comfortable, familiar life behind to travel the world and live nomadically without a permanent home, and how he used his spiritual practice, his sadhana, to find the courage to say yes to an unknown future and the promise of his full potential. And we close by talking a bit about Tony's history of creating communities and Tony shares some very exciting news that will be of interest to any yoga teacher interested in hosting retreats and trainings abroad. So if you resonate with anything that Tony talks about in this episode, know that you can head over to dharmatalk.show and type Tony in the search bar, and you'll find all the notes and links for this episode, including Tony's recommended books and his upcoming events. And as you may know, I've got a running list of every book ever recommended on Dharma Talk. So if you're running out of books on your shelf, you're looking for something new to read, go to henrywins.com slash books and pick out your next read. Without further ado, please enjoy my interview with Tony Lupinacci. Tony, this is so awesome to have this conversation. You know, we've had many personal, deep conversations one on one, but this will be the first time we're sharing it out in the public. And there's been lots happening in your world that we can catch up on. So, first, how are you feeling today? I am so excited to be here. Um, it's just so cool for me to see what this platform has turned into. You know, I I remember walking down the street with you in Williamsburg. Uh, I think we were on like Berry Street or something and you were talking to me about this project and talking about having Hargovind on the first episode and Aaron and um, I just feel really honored and grateful to be here and also to be able to catch up. <laughs> and talk. Yeah, me too. <laughs> me too. The, the, the pleasure is on this side of the microphone as well. And yeah, thank you for you know, being there through the infancy of this project and helping me uh, craft a vision for it. Oh my gosh, it's it's been it's been such a pleasure for me to have it as a resource with all of the traveling I've done. It's just really like the first thing that I do when I hop on any plane, I just turn on Dharma Talk and listen to all my friends and also people that like I don't know that I really respect in the community. So it's been a real treat for me to be able to like just listen. Well, let's give you the opening question, which I'm sure that you are well acquainted with, but I'd love to hear your take. What does the word Dharma mean to you? And what is your Dharma as you understand it today? Um, well, the first thing that pops into my mind when I hear the word Dharma is obviously the person. And um, I feel a lot of gratitude for, for him because that's where I took one of my first yoga classes. And um, funny enough, like for a long time, the word Dharma was sort of like weaved into a lot of my like secret login passwords as well. So like I'm very attached to the <laughs> word. But um, the, the reason why I've kept it so dear and like kind of um, 
had it as uh, such an active part of my life and, and login passwords and different things like this is because um, it's a nice reminder for me to live in my truth and to um, constantly check in with what I'm doing and why I'm doing it. And um, to me, that's really what Dharma means is, is finding my truth and, and living that on like a daily basis um, so that I can be of service to others so that I can, you know, elevate those around me so that I can um, also work through the karmas that I have in this lifetime and do the work that I'm really meant to do here. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I think I know, I have an idea of what your answer to this might be just having followed your journey, but sometimes when people talk about finding their purpose or their truth, it kind of feels like it's something that's static, you know, like there's a, there's an obvious destination that everyone is meant to land on, but you have reinvented yourself so many times, you know, you were the, you were a co-founder of Butter Elixir, a co-founder of Lighthouse Yoga School. And since we've spent a lot of time together, you've gone on and traveled the world. So what, um, how do you relate finding purpose and truth to evolution, personal development? Well, you know, to me, through all of the things that I've done so far in my life, and I've, I plan to do a lot more, which is, which is interesting to look back and retrospect and, and have like a little list of things that I've done and then think like, oh, wow, I wonder what else there is uh, that I'm going to get up to. Um, but to me, the through line is connection. Um, even before Butter Elixir, I worked in fashion for a really long time and I never cared about fashion at all, really. I, I love beauty and I love design, but the reason why I loved what I did when I worked in fashion is because to me, it was an access point to connect, connect with clients, connect with my coworkers. And I found that to be kind of like the access point um, no matter what I do, whether I'm, uh, you know, working on an all natural product line or building a yoga studio or teaching workshops and retreats and teacher trainings. And, uh, to me at the, at the root of it all is, is this, um, this yearning to connect with others and, and share and listen and, uh, sort of just like, be there to share the experience of life. And, and that's what I feel like my purpose really is. And I use, um, you know, entrepreneurship and yoga and fashion and all of these other things to kind of like get to that point of connection where I can meet someone where they are and they can meet me where I am and we can like share a moment, share an experience. And, and I actually think that the most potent way to do that is through yoga. Yeah. Well, I mean, that is one of the, uh, one of the direct interpretations of the word is, is that union, the connection. Yeah. So let's talk about that. What, what does your current yoga practice look like and how are you using it as a means to practice connection to others? You know, it's so interesting. Um, I just had the pleasure of, of finishing uh, the 50 hour practice intensive with Rose Aaron Vaughn that I know you participated in um, a year or so ago as well. And it was such a treat for me because I've been traveling so much um, ever since I left New York in November. And I've had little spurts of, um, you know, practicing with groups of people, like when I've been teaching on teacher trainings or when I've been leading retreats. But it's not as regular as it was when I was, um, you know, running Lighthouse. So I've been practicing a lot on my own, on my mat, alone, just kind of like figuring out where my practice lies, trying new things. Because ever since I left New York, I've also had the pleasure of being exposed to a lot of different teachers that I hadn't been before. I took a biomechanics training with Jules Mitchell. I took a Katona training with um, Dejus uh, Juvelier Keats. And um, then I recently just took that training with Aaron. And then I'm going to be taking another Kula training uh, coming up at the end of the month with Nikki Villela. And um, I've had a, a really nice time 
alone on my mat, connecting with myself and processing a lot of this new information um, and just seeing kind of like where it lands in my body and then taking that and then sharing it with like so much excitement when I go and teach because I don't teach as regularly as I used to when I was at Lighthouse. Um, I just get to teach, you know, weekend workshops and intensives and, you know, bits and pieces on trainings and retreats. But when I do teach, there is like an intensity to it uh, that there maybe wasn't as much because I was doing it more often. And now it's such a treat to connect and um, be with others in that type of space. Whereas before, I think maybe I, I took our little bubble at Lighthouse for granted a little bit. Um, but it's, it's been really nice to share um, when I get to. And it's also been really nice to connect with myself on my, on my own map. Yeah. I mean, what I, what I gather from your response is that your teaching itself is a big part of that practice of connection. And, and that makes perfect sense, especially when you have uh, a deeper contrast between your time spent in practice somewhat in isolation and, um, and, and kind of saving up that energy to share with others. Yeah, absolutely. And I do have to say too, um, you know, my partner is also a yoga teacher, uh, Anton Brandt, and he and I uh, practice together also sometimes. But the interesting thing about us practicing together is that he and I have very different practices. So we will practice simultaneously, but be doing completely different things. Um, <laughs> And then we'll find each other somehow like in the middle. And sometimes there will be like a little bit of a crossover with a pose or we'll share a concept or an idea or uh, something or verbally or just kind of like hint at it to one another physically. And um, we definitely share space and share energy and share practice in that way, which is also really beautiful and nice. But it's also cool to not be doing the same thing, have very different practices and different approaches. So that's been really fun too. Yeah, that, that is interesting. I mean, we, especially, you know, at the Dharma center, there, there's a lot of talk about collective consciousness and moving together to, you know, amplify the benefits of everyone's practice. That's one of the reasons that people practice together, but it's, it's fun to hear you talk about practicing side by side with someone who, with whom you obviously have a deep, you know, heartfelt connection and probably a psychic intuitive connection as well that you can be connected in that way without necessarily doing the same physical movements. Totally, totally, absolutely. And it's also fun too, because it, it also feels kind of like a, like a playtime or like a lab in some ways. And he and I made it very clear to one another in the beginning that like neither one of us was the other's teacher in any way. Since we're both yoga teachers, we wanted to like clarify that space and be like, okay, you have the freedom and the right to do whatever you want to do in your practice. And I have the freedom and the right to do whatever I want to do in my practice. And sure, there can be crossover, but like there is not one of us who is the other's teacher. So it is really fun for us to just like have this lighthearted um, moment of sharing when we do practice together. When you had that conversation, did you consider like, I mean, there's another way to do that, right? That's still, uh, that's still equal where you take turns teaching one another. Was that something that you discussed? Um, not really. I mean, we definitely do take turns teaching one another. Like when I, when I'm teaching a class or when he's teaching a class, but I think that the conversation and, and the way that we were discussing, it was more like on a, on a broader scale of like, um, we're not like giving each other feedback after the other one's class or anything like that. Like, I see. you know what I mean? Like, like he would never consider me to be one of his teachers and I wouldn't consider him to be one of my teachers in that way. I mean, we learn from each other constantly, um, but it's not that sort of like formal teacher student relationship type of yeah, thing. Yeah. I, I see what you mean. It's like about establishing, um, like the boundaries of, of a hierarchical power dynamic kind of thing. Sure. Yeah, totally. So, I mean, you've been taking all of these trainings now, uh, how I'm sure that there's been a lot of change to the way that you're practicing and the way that you're teaching since we last spent a lot of time together. 
has it been difficult for you to pick and choose elements that you want to integrate? Are you even integrating or are you choosing to keep these practices distinct when you share them? No, I'm definitely integrating all of it into one big amalgamation of whatever my practice is right now. Um, the The first training that I did was the Jules Mitchell training, which um, was incredible. She's uh, sort of like the leading teacher right now in biomechanics, and she wrote a book called Stretching Redefined, which is kind of like, in a way, like a big myth-busting book about yoga anatomy and alignment. Um, and it was really good for me because I was never the type of yoga teacher that was really all that interested in anatomy. I was more interested in, in the more sort of like esoteric elements of yoga or the Mm -hmm. physical elements of yoga or, um, things like that. But she broke things down in such a way that was really digestible and, exciting and new and interesting. And, you know, like one of the things that she says is alignment is contextual. Like, who are you looking at? What is their practice? Where are they coming from? What are they trying to achieve in the pose too? You know, one of the things that I think, you know, we've heard oftentimes uh, in yoga is like, never bring your knee beyond your ankle in warrior two, whatever you do, don't bring your knee beyond your ankle in warrior two. But then try walking upstairs, you know, without bringing your knee beyond your ankle. Yeah, you, right. You can't do it, you know? And it's like, why then is that pose the way it is? If it's because the poses are based on Euclidean geometry and we want them to look a certain way, then fine, we can just say that, you know, we, this is, you know, this is how I'm teaching warrior two because I, I believe that it needs to look this way or whatever. But um, it, it was a lot of reprogramming and beginning to understand all of this sort of like subliminal or not so subliminal fear mongering that happens in the yoga community that I like wasn't even aware of because it was just so pertinent. You know, it was just kind of everywhere. Oh, yeah. Um, it's totally pervasive. Yeah. Um, uh, another one of those examples that I've come across and, you know, I'll bring it up because you just did Aaron's training and I know that she does this often is, um, some people are, are so, so violently against moving from warrior one into warrior two. And it's mm-hmm. like, what's the big deal? Like your hip should be able to move like that in sure. my mind. Like you would, you would benefit from being able to not have that restriction of movement. So, um, Absolutely. What, what were some of the other myths that were busted from that book um, or that training? Uh, gosh, there, there are so many. I mean, never put your foot on your inner knee in tree pose, I guess, was like a big one that people were talking about. Oh, another one that I really loved was um, the Chaturanga alignment cue where, uh, you know, never let your elbows come above your ribs. But then we say, oh, yeah, come into a plank pose lower down for Cobra, you know, your elbows definitely come above your ribs when you Mm -hmm. lower down for Cobra. Um, so anyway, it was really interesting. And she's also just like a very cool person. I mean, she's like no nonsense, very interesting human being, um, and full of like energy and life. And, um, it was very cool. And then the other training that I did, uh, was kind of the opposite of that was, which was a training with, um, with Dejus Juvelier Keats, who's um, one of the senior yoga teachers from the Katoni Yoga lineage. And she studies directly with Naveen and travels the world and and teaches these intensives. And and the training I did with her was kind of the opposite. It was much more esoteric, but also practical at the same time. Um, But I I learned uh, a lot of body mapping that was really interesting. Katoni Yoga and Naveen Mishan created this um, system uh, with that they call the magic square, which is essentially like mapping the body to create a deeper sense of awareness. And, uh, it was a really beautiful, um, tool to gain, um, that I use regularly now in my meditation practice. And, um, I also like to use it in class, uh, from time to time, which is really fun. And then of course, with um, with Aaron, I learned all about the meridians, which was an interesting layer, especially after the Katoni Yoga training, because they both 
um, are based in sort of like Taoism. So what Aaron was teaching was a much more practical lens on the more esoteric approach or versus the most, the more esoteric approach that the Katona yoga lineage uses. So it was really cool to kind of like put the pieces together and now I have no idea what I'm going to get from the Kula training. I've taken classes at Kula before, but I've never really studied um, there, but I'm excited to learn more. And, and I just love forever being a student. You know, it's, I, I love what I get from being in that um, atmosphere of, of learning and workshopping and um, trying new things and stepping outside of my comfort zone, which has been mm-hmm. one of my huge, um, huge through lines, I guess, this past year. It's just been all about stepping outside of my comfort zone, which has been wildly rewarding and, and super cool. Absolutely. I was, I was just about to go there. Um, I can see that, you know, you're, you're hungry for new learnings and and new experiences simply based on the choices that you've made in your life in the past year or two. You know, you've stepped away from everything that was comfortable. You lived in New York for many years and now you've created this whole new life for yourself. That's full of uncertainty, risk, and obviously of course, lots of upside on the other end of that risk. So, Talk us through, you know, what, what, how did that happen? Like, how did you find the, the courage to suddenly uproot your life and do something completely new? Ah, it's like a really interesting question. And I think one of the, the most, um, curious parts of, of what you said was, was this idea of choice, like me choosing to, to make this, um, make this change. And, and I don't necessarily know that I did choose it. Um, instead I, I, what I think was happening in my life and where I was, um, when I was at lighthouse is I, I really feel like I was holding on to like this little seed of potential and I was stuck in this place of doubt and uncertainty and, um, not knowing exactly like what I was supposed to be doing and how I was supposed to be helping others and affecting the world. And I I was satisfied. Of course, I had like a beautiful thriving community that I was a part of at Lighthouse that I'm still very grateful for. But instead of holding on to like that little seed of potential, I decided or I allowed myself to step into that potential. And in that moment, choice and decision dissipated and I don't know how else to describe it, but I just like, I just kind of allowed for grace to flow through. And, and it wasn't like I ever decided to leave New York for all this time after 19 years. Um, and it wasn't like I had a lot of gravity with like leaving lighthouse even, um, and stepping away from that. It, it honestly, it's so crazy to think about it, but it really just kind of like took me away, you know, and, and, and I allowed, and I think that was the difference is for the longest time I was resisting and I was stuck in this um, space of like trying to change the reality of certain situations. And instead of trying to like change certain things that I had no control over, I stopped resisting those things and stopped resisting what is and began to allow. And that allowed me to take my destiny into my own hands and, um, and just kind of like see what life had in store. And it's been, it's been pretty wonderful. And, um, yeah, it's a really, really good feeling. Uh, and when I left New York, I was I was in Bali for a couple of months. I was teaching there, um, and uh, I had an incredible time teaching a bunch of like workshops and seminars and different things. I led a retreat in Bali, and then uh, traveled around Asia a bit. Thailand went to Myanmar, which was very interesting, like land of a thousand temples. It was a really powerful experience. And then after that, we headed to Portugal 
And um, I'd been at Cocoon for a little while there, and I had the pleasure of um, leading mantra and meditation on the Sacred Figs 200-hour training, uh, which took place in Portugal, and being able to connect um, on that level with those students and have such an important role in their yoga teacher training uh, was probably one of the most incredible experiences I've ever had as a teacher and maybe one of the most incredible experiences I've had in my life. And then from there, I um, left to teach a bunch of workshops all over Europe. I was in Paris at uh, Mathieu Boulderon's studio, Lomi Yoga, and I was in Rome a couple of times and in Milan. And I'm headed to Spain in a couple of weeks to uh, teach at the Yoga Box in Valencia. So yeah, it's in, it's been a wild ride. And if anybody would have told me a year or so ago that this is what I'd be doing and this is how I'd be living, like traveling the world and not really having like a a home <laughs> uh, and uh, teaching like this, I, I wouldn't have, I wouldn't have really believed them. Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, I mean, I'm so proud to even hear you like go through that and reflect on that. Uh, it's really cool to see and really inspiring, Tony. Um, thank you. Let's, let's get specific on this, you know, um, about this idea of allowing rather than resisting. I think a big part of resistance is feeling a need to control your situation and have uh, a long-term projection of what's going to happen. And I can, I can see, you know, I can hear from your story that you kind of took it one step at a time without knowing what the possibility would be after that. And because of that allowance, um, your expectations for what was possible were exceeded and things happened that you never could have even planned for in, in your best case scenario, you know? So take us to one moment, perhaps toward the beginning of that journey of this unfolding where you caught your old pattern of resistance. You noticed it and you said, okay, I'm going to let that go. I'm going to allow, what did that look like? Hmm. Ah, that's an interesting question. Um, well, I think I'd like to just preface it by saying like, yes, allowing is important, but for me, the, the thing that allowed me to get to the place of being able to surrender to grace and surrender to, uh, what is, and sort of like step into the potential that I'm talking about, um, is, is my sadhana practice. Mm -hmm. And, um, I, I really prepared myself over a long period of time for, for this moment. And, um, you know, like there, there came a point where, um, you know, like I knew it was time for me to step away from, from lighthouse and from that community. And there was a lot of fear uh, to do that because I had poured my heart and soul into it. And I felt like it was my baby, which I do with everything. I had the same type of feeling when I decided to step away from butter and, um, yeah. and there is a, there is a part of me that in, in that moment when I, when I knew it was time to go, that I could have backpedaled. I could have continued to tread water. I could have stayed in that same place of, um, not living my, not living up to my fullest potential. And, and I just sat for a moment and listened. Uh, I also pray a lot. This is something I know you know about me, but, <laughs> but I, I say a lot of prayers all the time, constantly. Uh, I like pray to, you know, my, my angels, I pray to God, I pray to the universe, the source, the, you know, divine masters, everybody. And I ask for exactly what I want <clears throat> to have happen in certain situations. And in that situation, I just said, I just asked for courage. You know, I asked for courage and strength to like be able to, to surrender and walk away. And, <clears throat> and I was able to do it. And I didn't look back and I didn't in that moment, repeat any of the same 
situations or any of the same patterns that I had in the past. And coincidentally, not so coincidentally, a lot of opportunity came pouring in. So instead of me saying no to my past, it actually felt like I was saying yes to my future. Beautiful. I just, con- I just continually started saying yes, yes, yes. Okay, yes, I'll teach in Bali. Yes, I'll teach on this teacher training. Yeah, I'll lead this retreat. Yeah, sure, let's go to Myanmar. I don't even know where it is on the map. <laughs> <You know? laughs> but like, it just turned into like lots of yeses. And that's a really, really good place for me to be. That is, that is so beautiful, Tony. That's just amazing to hear. Um, I'm sure there are so many people listening who can relate to that. You know, it's natural for us to want to hold on to what we've experienced in the past as being good, even when it's complicated. You know, it's not black and white. There's there's a lot of gray in there and there's negativity and blockages and barriers associated with that good. We see it because we've experienced it before and we want to keep it. But you, Mm -hmm. you know, you prayed and you found that courage to say, maybe there's something even better out there for me that will allow me to shine through. And you got it. Yeah, yeah, I did. And and I believe like, I believe deeply that like, it's a ripple effect, you know, like, I, I know that like, by me, allowing myself to live my fullest potential, I also am allowing other people to live their fullest deten- uh, potential, you know, and I know that that lighthouse is thriving and it's doing so well. And there's nothing that makes me happier than to know that like things are going well there and butter is thriving as well. You know, it's like all of these little things that I've been a part of are now also like doing really, really well. And it just makes me happy that (laughs) we're all doing well and, you know, living our Dharma and um, you know, it's, it's still, it's still connected. I'm still connected to all of these things I've been a part of. And I just have so much, so much gratitude for all of the experiences that I've been able to have and um, people I've been able to connect with. And um, it's, it's been really, really a cool ride so far. (laughs) Yeah. I mean, you've been slowly and steadily, uh, collecting all of these new access points to connection, just as you put it before, you know, it's your yoga practice. It's the, the sanghas of, of yoga communities that you've, um, integrated yourself into and all of these entrepreneurial projects. So Tony, what is, what is on the horizon for you? What are the things that you are excited to share and, um, and use as further access points to connection in the future? Well, uh, a couple of things. First, I'm, I'm really excited to be hosting this retreat um, at Cocoon, Portugal, um, which is uh, my, my partner's yoga retreat center. And it's been sort of like a little bit of a home base for me uh, while I've been traveling. Uh, and Taffy's there, my dog. <laughs> She's 16. And uh, I'm really excited to be able to reconnect with a lot of my students and friends from Lighthouse um, that are coming to join me on the retreat. And I'm also super honored and um, excited to be co-leading the retreat with Lulu Sony, uh, who is a student and teacher at Lighthouse. So she's going to be joining me on the retreat, which I couldn't be more thrilled about. And that's happening in just a couple of days. Um, I'll be doing the same retreat at the same place uh, in September of 2020. So if People uh, didn't get a chance to come on this one. There's always next year, which I'm um, excited about. No need for FOMO. Then, Just join next year. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, and then, yeah, I I have some extra, extra exciting news. So one of the things that I've been really focused on uh, throughout the past year is uh, opening a yoga retreat center. And I've been drawn to uh, doing this in Italy, specifically in the region of Puglia, which is the heel of uh, the boot, if Italy is a boot. It's like that long, skinny part at the end. It has an ocean on both sides, and it's one of the most beautiful parts of the world that I've ever been. And um, my dad is Italian. My grandparents are there. So I, I feel a deep 
ancestral connection to the land and to the people and to the culture there. Uh, and I spent a little bit of time last year looking for property and then uh, quite a bit of time this summer with Anton uh, looking for property. And we saw over, I think, 30, 30 properties total, uh, 30 pieces of land total. And we um, found one that we loved. We just looked at each other and we knew that this was it. And we placed an offer and it was accepted and we placed our deposit. So we are going to start breaking ground um, on a yoga retreat center in Fulia within like the next couple of months. So we're still in the process of like solidifying all of the financials and working with investors and, you know, uh, obtaining some of the final funding for it. But um, it's moving right along and now we own a piece of land in Italy, which we're in the process of owning a piece of land in Italy, which is really, really exciting. That is super exciting. Wow. Um, all those little minor details, you know, that's just like, uh, it's all stuff that needs to happen, of course, but the, the grand vision is in place and I can totally see how this fits right in line with that common thread that's been, um, a piece of everything that we've talked about so far. You know, you are, creating a place, a home for people to connect. And in doing so, you're even making this connection to your own ancestral lineage. I think that is so cool on many dimensions. Yeah, I couldn't be more excited to um, to be working on this project and uh, to be building another community. You know, I really feel like, and not only building another community, but just like continuing to grow the communities that I'm already a part of. Um, and I just, I love the idea of, of being able to create a space where people can come and host their programs, host their trainings, be fully supported and taken care of, be in a beautiful place. It's, you know, 10 minutes from the sea and uh, close to like all of these really charming, incredible historic towns with like wildly beautiful like grottos and caves. And um, I'm also just really excited to share this part of the world with people because it's it's been a really important place for me um, in the past year. And uh, I think that it has a lot of really incredible magic energy there. So I'm um, I'm super excited and to be doing it with my partner too, um, for us to be collaborating in this way. is like a really big, uh, exciting new step. Yeah. Yeah. It's a big, uh, commitment to take a project like that on together. Um, yeah, it's probably way too early to, to even venture a guess, but do you have an idea of when it might be open? Yeah. And we're, we're aiming for about like two and a half years. Okay. Um, yeah. And right now it's, it's uh, five hectares, which is about 12 acres, and uh, it has an, an ancient structure, which locally they call it a lamia, which is basically like an old horse stable with like gorgeous, like arched ceilings. And I think that we're going to use that as the yoga shala, and then the rest of the space will will be building new. Wow. Ancient meaning, meaning like dating back to the, the Roman Empire, or what does that mean? Yeah, I mean it's it's like I think 15th, 16th century, like oh, okay. very old, stable. So I mean, uh, it's pretty old. Yeah, yeah, it's really, it's really old. <laughs> yeah. So no more horses, just a bunch of horse poses instead. Yes. Yeah. Exactly. You'll have to come and demo. You've got you've got the best horse around. Well, I would love to come visit your new retreat center. Um, before or after it opens. That sounds super cool. And I've never been to that part of Italy, actually. So um, you describe it very well. You do a good job of making it compelling. Oh, good. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. <laughs> well, Tony, apart from getting your message out on the podcast, what are you doing today to live your Dharma? Today, I um, woke up, I did my meditation practice. I did my mantra practice. Um, I practiced uh, some of these new meridian activation uh, techniques that I learned uh, with Erin at her training and did a little bit of studying on the meridians and trying to sort of like absorb and retain some of the information that I just learned. 
Um, and then I had to hit the streets and start running errands. And um, I put together these really beautiful um, gift bags for all of my guests that are coming on my Portugal retreat. And uh, I'm really excited Lucky to people. Um, place those in their, in their rooms and uh, get this retreat going. And yeah, so that was, that was how, and then talking to you too. <laughs> Well, I really appreciate you finding time to do that, uh, especially with all of the excitement leading up to your retreat. I hope you have an amazing time with that. I'm sure it will be um, really rewarding, not just for you, but of course, for the retreat students, guests as well. Tony, Thanks. I think now is the perfect time to move on to the prana round. So I'm going to ask you the six rapid fire questions and have you answer in minimum one word, maximum one sentence. Okay. Cool. In one word, why do you practice yoga? Connection. I knew it. <laughs> <laughs> What's your favorite yoga pose and why? Oh, it's so hard. Um, you know, mountain pose in lotus um, <laughs> with the arms up. And I love that pose because I feel like everything disappears. My mind goes away and I'm transported to a place of constant, steady, focused awareness. Yes, that posture requires absolute undivided focus and attention or else you fall on your butt. Yeah. <laughs> What's the single best cue or piece of advice you've ever received from a yoga teacher? Um, Anton says this in some of his classes and he got it from his teacher, Naveen Mishan, uh, who says, Forget who hurt you, remember who you are. Forget what happened and remember where you're going. Nice. You've really embodied that. Thanks. Yeah, it really resonated with me. Recommend one book, modern or ancient, for our audience. Hmm. Recommend one book, modern or ancient. Well... That is a really good question. Uh, you know, I'm reading I'm reading a book right now that I quite like, and it's really been helpful for me in, in hosting programming. It's called The Art of Gathering uh, by Priya Parker, and um, it's a lot about intention and um, artful connections that are not coincidental, um, but in fact, like really meaningful and deep and thoughtful. And that's something I'm working on. So it's been really, uh, it's been really nice to read it right now. I don't know if it's like the most powerful book I've ever read, but it's, uh, it's been really, uh, good for me to read right now in this moment. Yeah, that's great. And, and right on theme with, uh, with your intention for your life at the moment. So thanks for sharing that. Is yoga for everyone? Hmm. I'm not sure. Um, I, I can only speak for myself. Um, I've been, that's another thing I've been working on a lot this past year is just speaking from I and speaking from my own perspective and my own experience. And for me, yoga, yoga really saved, saved my life in a lot of ways. So, uh, I think it's worth a shot whether or not it's for everyone or not. I don't know. Um, but I think it's worth a shot. It sure has helped me. Nice answer. Last question, Tony, how can our audience get in touch with you and how can we support you in your Dharma? You can get in touch with me on Instagram. Uh, you can check out my website, uh, Uh and uh, come to one of my programs. Uh, I have a bunch of uh, cool things in the pipeline. I'll be in Valencia teaching there. If you're in Europe, come to Spain and spend the weekend with me, September 28th. Um, and then I'm going to be back in Bali uh, this winter. I'm going to be teaching mantra and meditation again on the Sacred Fig 200-hour training. So if you would like to get your 200-hour and spend 24 days in Bali working on yourself, uh, and learning how to teach yoga. It's going to be really incredible. So that's something I'm working on. And then directly after that, I'll be leading um, a retreat that I'm super excited about uh, with Anton in Morocco. 
Uh, so we'll be hosting a retreat in Morocco, four days in Marrakesh and three days in Essaouira, two yoga classes a day, uh, traditional food and a lot of adventure and exploration and connection <laughs> will be involved in all of those things. Um, so yeah, if you want to, um, get in touch, just feel free to message me. Uh, I, I like looking at my messages on, on Instagram and I'll, I promise I'll write back. I always do. <laughs> awesome, Tony. Thank you so much for sharing all of this and uh, and for inspiring all of us with your constant expansion and, and courage. I'm sure that we'll catch up soon in person. I don't know where, but somewhere on planet Earth. And I look forward to that day. I look forward to it too, Henry. It was so nice talking to you. And thank you again for having me on. It's uh, just been a real treat to be able to talk with you. Dharma Talkers, I hope you enjoyed listening to that conversation as much as I enjoyed having it. And if you did, please share it. Take a screenshot, share it on Instagram, and tag me at Henry Wins. I love hearing from you about the conversations that make an impact for you. We have the ability to shape the world through our thoughts, words, and conversation. So let's influence the collective consciousness together. All my gratitude to Rory Wagstaff of Ease of Mind Productions for keeping our audio crisp and operations smooth, and to Patrick Kiebzak of Momentology Music and Art for supplying the powerful soundtrack to these conversations. Please remember to subscribe, rate, and review, and tune in to new episodes of Dharma Talk every Thursday. I'll speak to you next week, and until then, keep living your Dharma.